Well, hello. The first time in 2023, which is very new and fresh, we welcome you to this, our show, which is Human Humane Architecture on ThinkTech Hawaii. And today's episode is going to be called the Banish um, Boston Boost uh, with a guest, uh, Matt Noblet, who is the leader of the firm, Banish Architects in Boston. Uh, and we have the Soto Brown in his Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we have me, Martin Desbang, back in Munich, Germany. So quite spread out legs. And in this episode, we will further talk about how some tempered architecture and it's uh, doing well in uh, the short summer can give us inspiration for our endless summers back in Honolulu. Life. So happy new year to everyone again. And with this view here, this gets us back to what connects us because that's where we all met in person the first time uh, at the end of the last year. So DeSoto, uh, tell us what this picture here, well, we see what it is. It is Honolulu. We see the skyline. And we see an explosion there. But tell us the circumstances and background. When you so this it. is... This is the uh, celebration of the new year of 2023 coming to us in Honolulu. And this is a view of Waikiki on the right and an explosion, as you said, of fireworks in the sky on the left. And I took this picture looking from my family home on the slopes of Diamond Head, looking towards Waikiki. And as I think it might be, this is the first time in 40 years or thereabouts that I've watched this New Year's celebration from this vantage point because I haven't lived in my family house for many years because I live in my own house nearby Kapahulu. And the point is, my mother, who is 102 years old, is unfortunately or realistically nearing the end of her life. I will be moving into this house. It is a Ossipoff designed house, Vladimir Ossipoff, famous local architect. So I will be immersing myself fairly soon in the care and feeding of a house from 1948, which is going to occupy a lot of my time, but I think will be enjoyable. So that's how I'm starting 2023. And thank you for asking. All right. Thanks for sharing again. Sorry about your mom, but I uh, appreciate your your point of view. If Aang said she had a very good and long life. Absolutely. It's Since a, 1920, and that's a lot of stuff to have seen and yeah. experienced. <laughs> so she was looking down here at a newborn and didn't even see the Royal Hawaiian down there because that was 10 years later, right? Well, no, yeah, she was, uh, she was, in 1920, there was no Royal Hawaiian Hotel. There was only Mo the Moana Hotel. Yeah, and this yeah. is the view that I grew up looking at from when, when I was born, just in my lifetime. Aloha Tower at 10 stories was the tallest building in the entire Hawaiian islands. So mm -hmm. I've seen Honolulu go from no high-rise buildings to hundreds and hundreds of high-rise buildings. Indeed. And I, um, I put in that little um, <clears throat> caption at the bottom there, and then um, it was all over the news that our German Minister of Defense was criticized for having wished everyone a new year by standing in Berlin uh, at the time of fireworks with her cell phone, supposedly. So the, the technical quality wasn't anywhere, well, any any anywhere close to what we get here from you, Eric, and from ThinkTech. <laughs> and um, and they basically said it wasn't, uh, you know, the most uh, sensitive what you did. But uh, Matt, you and I talked uh, and said maybe the the reaction to that was was uh, was a little overboard because um, myself, I can say, how can you look at explosions and not think about the explosions that are going on um, at uh, in the Ukraine? for not leisure purpose, but causing pain and death. So I, I, I give her that. And again, the way she said it and the whole you know, setting maybe wasn't the most, wasn't the best. But uh, that being said, let's get to the next slide, which is a compilation of many things here. But at the bottom right, we have, this is the Star Advertiser. 
uh, the the online uh, version of it that I scroll through. And we have, of course, uh, the daily coverage of the disaster um, uh, that is going on in the Ukraine. But unlike almost now nearing a year ago where it was the main thing, right? We unfortunately almost got used to it. And some way less, you know, uh, tragic um, in the scope, I mean, still bad enough is the news above it. And uh, maybe I leave this up to you when, when you heard about that, because it, it kind of speaks uh, about how desperate we Germans try to have the tropics here in Germany, which is impossible climatically because tropical fish can never live in frigid cold water, right? But we still try hard. So I leave it up to you guys to explain what that is and what incident happened there. Well, there was a huge cylindrical aquarium in the lobby of a hotel in Berlin. Largest, tallest aquarium in the entire world. And as you said, it was filled with tropical fish because the Germans love to look at things and dream about the tropics. And it unfortunately burst. And fortunately, however, it occurred at 5.50 a.m., just before 6 a.m. So two people were injured, but nobody was killed or badly hurt. And that was because nobody was up at six o'clock in the morning in this building. So except now, for the fish. except for the fish, and they have, of course, died. And the, the, the amount of water was so extreme that it broke through the front of the facade of the building into the street. So, yes, it is a sign of desperation to try to create the tropics in the temperate zone. But I do have to say, I have read that this is the warmest winter on record, possibly in Europe to the point where there isn't in the Alps, there's a real lack of snow. So you may be having tropical fish in the water sooner than you think. You're getting an A for your weekly German lesson to Solde because right above that, what you just um, intuitively translated, record temperature on Sylvester, which is New Year's Eve, 20 degrees Celsius in Munich. And do a little material science here. The material of that uh, aquarium was actually not glass, but plexiglass. But from the background of your, your office, uh, the, the, the root of your guys' office, uh, Matt, you want to talk about where plexiglass has been used in which project? And for that matter, please get us the top right uh, image <laughs> of what we see there, Matt. Well, I mean, plexi is used not not infrequently in building construction uh, because of obviously its transparent qualities, but the fact that it weighs far less than glass. So it's a lot easier to, to support. Um, and probably one of the biggest um, uses of it, it, at least up until that time, was the Munich Olympic Stadium in, uh, um, in, in southern Germany that was built for the 1972 Olympic Games. Uh, which has a giant cable net structure that's clad with um, with plexiglass plexiglass panels um, that uh, have have weathered quite well over the years. They had to be replaced once uh, so far, but um, are really a kind of a key material component to one of the more successful uh, projects of, of I think really the 20th century in in terms of modern contemporary architecture. Yeah, and we've talked about this quite a bit before DeSoto as well, right, uh, about the project. And um, you're probably not fast enough as I was last minute, thanks to you, Matt, because when we talked last time, you said, what, you haven't seen that <laughs> amazing exhibit? So I, we rushed there and saw it in the last couple of days. And us, as you see up there, uh, our Gunther, uh, Gunther Despang, looking at your Gunther Banish, <laughs> and you have a Fry model, one of Fry Otto's models in front of it. And then talking about, um, you know, authenticity and appropriateness of materiality in the built environment. Um, on the left part of this image here, you see Semi and I before we left. Um, stopped by you, DeSoto. You took care of our cars kindly. We went to Hanama Bay. And Hanauma Bay, I, you both told me you have never seen that, uh, which I've seen once. And then I have its creator, Francis Oda, once at a Dokomomo talk story, talk about uh, the visitor center. And we see this in the picture at the bottom, in the bottom, in the middle there. 
and uh, and he explained it as to be sort of camouflaged and hidden and almost seeming like natural. But uh, the irony is that as um, sad as it is that the, the natural coral bleaches, this stuff here, which is all fake and man-made, is also bleaching. And you see kind of cracks in there <laughs> and some fibroblasts coming through. And that's kind of almost <laughs> ironic for me if you consider what um, uh, Hanauma Bay has been the scene for a movie that is very representative for your youth, DeSoto, right, and statehood. And maybe you want to talk about that and also at the, about the show quotes of the architecture that is portrayed in that movie. Well, the movie that we're talking about is Blue Hawaii from 1961, which stars Elvis Presley. And you can see in the lower left corner, there's Elvis and his so-called girlfriend, whose name is supposedly Miley Duval. And they hang out at Hanama Bay in the course of this film and entirely fictitious. Elvis lives there for a time in a coconut shack, which is constructed by him and his beach boy friends. Well, in reality, in 1961, there was no such thing like that there at all. But they did film a number of scenes there. And the other thing about uh, Blue Hawaii, which is kind of wonderful for us, is you do get a, you do get to see some of the architecture of the time in color on the big screen. You definitely, for example, frequently see in shots of Honolulu the Ala Moana building, which was brand new at that time, and it had no other buildings around. Around it, so it really stood out, and it has La Ronde on the top, the rotating restaurant, and it is a building we like because it was so innovative for its time. And you also get to see the uh, Coco Palms Resort Hotel on Kauai, that was also a new and modern thing at the time that this film was made as well. Yeah, and we see these two projects uh, show quoted in the center there of of the slide here. So these are the projects. And these projects are, um, they're not, they're, of course, um, you would say, um, you know, interpretive. Uh, they, they don't have anything to do with indigenous means and methods and practices. But the, uh, um, the, uh, on the very left, this is the, um, the, uh, the marketplace, international marketplace, which architecture by Pete Wimberly and also the one at the very right of these three, um, is the Coco Palm, which you uh, said, this is also um, by Pete Wimberley. So these are buildings that try to basically be an interpretation of the vernacular and do it sort of here and now in modern times and some a little bit more romantic about uh, the pre-contact architecture, but the Alamoana building in a very, very modern way that we once said, you know, could have been by the office of Banish in the, in the approach. They did it. So let's go to the next slide because um, we had to fly then and, 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 and basically uh, miss all this one here, luckily. But tell us a little bit about the craziness of, of, um, of weather that was going on in your area around the Christmas times, Matt. Uh, well, we had um, in the span of about 36 hours, we had a, a, a swing of about 51 degrees in temperature. Um, the days leading up to Christmas and over the Christmas holiday was, uh, it was around 11 degrees Fahrenheit here. Um, and then it warmed up on Monday and Tuesday to, uh, I think it was in the, in the mid to high fifties, uh, at that point. So, um, and, but we were really just experiencing kind of the tail end of a storm that really was catastrophic in a lot of parts of the country, Buffalo, Western New York, um, in other areas in the Midwest, saw uh, tremendous amounts of snow, and obviously that wreaked havoc with uh, with air travel as well. As we see here, in some ways, you uh, there's one picture at the very bottom right that you both and I do got a kick out of it because that thing that you also just sort of this uh, experienced in your youth when you lived there out there in that area in the cold, and you promised <laughs> yourself you never want to go back to there. But uh, some of your family um, are, uh, you know, they might think about that a little differently. What, what's the, <laughs> where is that? What is this about? <laughs> the photograph we just saw is, I, is uh, snow, real snow 
from the top of Mount Achaia. And on Christmas morning, my niece's husband, uh, they live obviously on Hawaii Island. He drove up to the top of Mount Achaia. He filled his uh, trip pickup truck bed with real snow, drove it back down, threw it on the ground, and his two kids and neighborhood kids got to play with snow like they were having a white Christmas. Well, that's as much snow as I prefer to deal with if I have to deal with snow at all. Um, but it, we, as it happened, we also happened to have had a significant storm here for us uh, that dropped a lot of snow on the top of Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. And I read that at one point, the snow plow on Mauna Kea uh, plowing the road to the summit encountered drifts as deep as 10 feet. So that's a goodly amount of snow here in the tropics. So sometimes the winter comes to the tropics like tropics come to the winter land of uh, Germany. But in that case, it's artificial, not real. Okay. There you go. And from the second skin of your folks there, we can see that the ambient temperature that actually makes that snow melt pretty fast, right, is still the, um, you know, endless summer one. While again, in, the, in these temperate climates that you are, you know, building, Matt, um, buildings have to do it all. They got to keep you warm in this brutal, you know, winter time, and they got to keep you cool in the summertime. And once again, show quote at the top right, your very sort of inaugural project there, the Gensheim building that we covered in the last couple of shows, is doing that to, fairly sufficiently in all seasons in a bioclimatic way, in a post-fossil way. This was the first leap platinum building, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In America. So. Yeah, first, first uh, lead commercial or commercial lead platinum or building of its size in, in North America, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the that part of the the, the 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 art of that kind of design lies in realizing that not necessarily, you know, in the winter you don't have to replicate summer conditions, and in the summer you don't necessarily have to replicate winter conditions. That's just what everybody's gotten accustomed to, right? That that you that it's that that the interior temperature should be stabilized to a degree that uh, no place on earth ever experiences. And, and so part of, I think our approach is to get people is to sort of reintroduce people to the idea that even interior climates can vary quite, quite broadly. Um, and, and, and you don't need to expend enormous amounts of energy to um, yeah, create kind of fake environments, right. That, that people don't really need. Absolutely, yeah. And we see maybe probably coincidentally on this compilation of images here, we see a lot of transportation going on, obviously challenged in on icy roads where, you know, trucks get off the road and cars and, um, and then, you know, talking trucks, trucking the snow down from on Ikea, as your folks did. <laughs> Or you see that guy down there on skis at Times Square, which this is. So um, talking transportation, um, as we talked in the last show, um, Honolulu, as we said, doesn't have any of these conditions. So um, bicycling is actually might be the preferred means of transportation, which should be fostered more. And that gets us to the next slide. Um, and we talked there, I just put it in, in, in words that Ben is his name, which I was missing out and blanking on last time, who's the guy at McCulley Bicycle at the repair shop, who goes back way with Jay as uh, together having been bicycle pioneers. And, and this is that what you uh, recommended to us, Matt, and there's some um, uh, snapshots here from that show in Germany that this um, colleague of ours here does. On that, um, on that tandem where you sit next to each other. <laughs> and uh, we, I mean, again, we said, you know, this is the, the longest um, German lesson for you to Soto because it's all in German. But um, anyways, it's, it's worth uh, watching, as we said. And at the bottom right is us in our second pi mobile that you kindly host also to Soto. Thanks for that. Uh, and uh, Matt, you said you guys should actually be on that tandem and do your shows, right? And how great would it be you bicycle to Kaka'ako and then the camera could go up just to the, you know, build environment you should talk about. <laughs> I think it would be fantastic. 
<laughs> assuming you survive assuming you survive <laughs> yeah yeah there, there is that there's there's some danger involved in this thing and it's not just fun so yeah we will pass this continue to pass this on to jay and probably back to ben maybe he can uh, build us such a vehicle here replicate <laughs> Okay, that being said, uh, in the six minutes left, let's still go back to the uh, to Harvard and your building he designed there for the engineering school and go to the next slide and just quickly um, refresh our memories about the context um, where it is in, you know, this is this is a home game for you guys because Harvard yeah. is in your town. So quickly explain us here the positioning of the project. Yeah, so this was this was a uh, a piece of land or a, a collection of lands that Harvard has acquired over uh, many years since the 90s. Um, in the lower left hand part of the slide here, you you can see the old Harvard Stadium, that kind of U shaped building and all the buildings to the uh, to the northeast of that, that's the Harvard Business School. But uh, most of the other parts of uh, what's inside this dotted red line had been acquired with the intention of expanding the campus on the south side of the Charles River, which is the big blue stripe going through the slide. Uh, and so in, in 2006, we were invited to and ultimately won a, an international design competition for what was to be the first set of constructions on this um, piece of land, uh, one of the pieces, the primary pieces of land that uh, that had been acquired as part of this overall effort to expand Harvard's campus. Yeah, and if you go back to the previous shows, you explain more in, deep, in, in, in depth and in detail how you approach the site. But let's jump to the next slide uh, right away, which seems to be maybe getting ahead of the game, but I don't think so. It's actually pretty much the order you had them in already for your presentation at our School of Architecture which um, we always remind the, um, the emerging generation to take um, an um, inside out design approach versus like a mobile arts and postmodern as the latest and outside in approach where you create a form and then you sort of smash function and people in there. <laughs> as you always you know, say, rightly so, of course, then you know, the building, you know, will take on an appearance and aesthetics and in best case, the pleasant one, but it's not designed that way around to make something pretty from the outside. And then you kind of, again, shove, shove it out and push something in. So that's why we want to jump right into the building here and experience it in its heart and core. So explain us more. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is what you're seeing in this slide is, uh, this is two two images of really the same space, um, but it's really it's it's really an important space for the building because what it does is kind of carves out um, a, a zone in the middle of the building where through this large glass wall uh, that has daylight enhancing uh, light shelves on the outside, we can really bring daylight deep into the building. So this atrium space, which kind of organizes all of the program around it allows uh, daylight to be more broadly distributed throughout the building uh, to make sure that the deeper spaces, particularly research spaces, which tend to be very deep um, floor plate spaces um, where people are working all the time um, and, and really should have access to, to daylight, if not to views outdoors, um, need the, what, what, what this, this space brings in. So the space functions as a kind of a community center for the whole building. People you know, know where they are because they can find this space and they can see across it and they know what's happening on other floors in the building and they can jump on these stairs or these bridges to get to those places. Um, but at the same time, it's also serving a very uh, a performance kind of function uh, in terms of ensuring that people have uh, equitable access to, to sort of natural phenomena. Absolutely. And, and, you know, with the background of the first two slides, explaining our different climates and um, climate changes and things, again, imagine this uh, in, there's probably going to be more cold to come before, it, you know, <laughs> summer again. So there's a lot of snow piling up outside and a lot of sub-zero temperatures, but it's going to feel pleasant in the building. Uh, without the expense uh, of fossil fuel. The building is mainly biochromatically powered. And for us, probably more interesting to sort of ride when it becomes summer, which we have all the time. 
That building is going to stay cool uh, the same way, again, without creating artificially chilled spaces by burning fossil fuel. So, but, but all that, I guess the, the beauty is that, um, you know, there isn't anyone with a, with a finger up and, you know, staying, standing there and preaching, right, that all the time it, it comes, it's, it's natural around you. I mean, you just, you just feel it, right? You see the people there comfortably dressed. You know, one of the uh, things that's always one of the things that I always find interesting is when I'm showing people this the building in the different spaces, how many of them who are not architects or designers even necessarily uh, just say, it just feels good in here. Like I, it's a place I want to be. Um, I see professors who are not necessarily part of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences working in the atrium, making the trip over from Cambridge. And one of, one of them I was. I know him and I spoke with him briefly and he said, uh, he's like, you know, I just come over here because I just like being here. It's a nice space and it's, it's comfortable and it's well lit and I can't find anything like it elsewhere in Cambridge. <laughs> you know, the other thing that this comes to mind when I look at this, and again, I'm a layperson, I'm not an architect or designer, but this is a very modern up-to-date building, but it does incorporate to me what seems like a very old concept of a courtyard because mm -hmm. buildings for many, for millennia, have been built with courtyards in different uh, societies and different cultures throughout the world in which you open up a central part of the building. And in doing so to the open air, obviously, you have light and you have air circulation and you're closer to nature. Now, obviously, in a traditional courtyard building, you don't have the protection of uh, walls or uh, a ceiling over it. You just open. But I think this does seem to be not unlike that concept. It's really not unlike that at all, DeSoto. And it's, and uh, I mean, I think it, the only thing you could say is it's been adapted for a cold weather climate, which is to say it's using glass and roof to make that a year round experience, right? The kind of winter garden concept. Okay. That had to be the final note because we're at the end of another exciting 28 minutes. So we will <laughs> dive more deeply into how this building does it and all its whistles and bells and little secrets that you will share with us that we're looking forward to. So see you next week for that. And until then, you guys all stay tropically exotic, exotically tropical wherever you are. I will. <laughs> <laughs>